Next up, we're going to have John Ackerman. He's going to be talking to us about the clock module. Okay, well, Scotty gave you a, a rundown of the, the basics of the clock module. I'll be uh, going into a little bit more detail about it, and particularly some of the design uh, decisions and trade-offs that we had to make. Um, and an overview, the idea of the clock module is to provide a, a, an accurate and stable source of the 122.88 megahertz signal that uh, clocks the analog to digital uh, converter and digital to analog converter in the radio. We also need a, a precise one pulse per second signal for time stamping. Uh, we need a time of day message also for time stamping. And we would very much like to have multiple uh, frequency outputs available. Um, in addition, uh, not mentioned here, but with the uh, premium GPS receiver that Scotty mentioned, uh, we will be able to do total electron count measurement, uh, which is a a measurement that's uh, very interesting for the space science community. Uh, so that will also be an output of the system. Uh, we want to make the clock module uh, usable outside of the Tangerine SDR. So there will be uh, an interface board with the same connectors on the data engine and with the support circuitry to allow you to uh, use the clock module standalone. And tentatively, we're calling that combination the, the SynthDO, is short for Synthesized Disciplined Oscillator. Just as a quick refresher, uh, a GPS disciplined oscillator uh, takes advantage of the fact that uh, GPS signals uh, are very noisy. They have a lot of second to second jitter uh, at uh, short term, but in the long term, they track the uh, atomic clocks at the uh, US Naval Observatory and National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, so they're a great long term uh, frequency and time source, but not so good in the short term. A crystal oscillator, on the other hand, can be very, very quiet in the short term, but it tends to drift and age and have an environmental uh, impact that make it not so good for the long term. So a GPSDO tries to get the best of both worlds. We use a phase lock loop uh, to steer a, a crystal oscillator from the GPS. And traditionally, uh, that was done by uh, developing a pulse per second signal from a uh, say 10 megahertz uh, oven uh, oscillator and comparing that pulse per second to the pulse per second that you get out of the GPS module. And then uh, with the phase lock loop, adjust the phase and frequency of the uh, 10 megahertz oscillator to keep the two pulses in sync. And the magic is uh, tuning the bandwidth of that phase lock loop to get the crossover point of where uh, the declining performance of the crystal oscillator meets the improving performance of the uh, GPS signal over time. And the plot here on the right shows just an example of that. This is an LN deviation plot, uh, which uh, can seem a little bit uh, strange, but uh, the x-axis is time logarithmically. So the very left side is one second, the right side is 100,000 seconds. And the uh, vertical or y-axis is a, a fractional frequency difference. Uh, one in 10 to the ninth is the same as one part in, ten, in uh, one part per billion, basically. And what, and what this chart is showing is the statistical likelihood, uh, very much like a standard deviation, but not quite, uh, of how much uh, jitter there will be if you take subsequent measurements uh, of the signal source at various intervals. So when we look at the left side at the one second point, what we're seeing there is the stability uh, of second to second measurements. If we go out to the, the 1K point, the 1,000, we're seeing the second or the, the uh, uh, measurement to measurement stability if we take a, a measurement every 1,000 seconds. So this gives us a, a visual way to see the performance of a uh, clock source at both short term and long term. The blue line is uh, the output from uh, a mid-range uh, GPS module, the, the uh, U-Blocks uh, NEO MAT. Uh, and you can see it is a completely straight line that starts at about one in 10 to the eighth at one second and continues downward at almost exactly a slope of uh, minus one uh, for uh, quite a while longer than this chart shows. And that's characteristic of the GPS because it has uh, bounced uh, second to second, but 30 nanoseconds, for example, out of one second a lot larger fraction than 30 nanoseconds out of a thousand seconds. 
So it makes sense that the performance uh, will improve as we go longer in time. Uh, the other two plots, the uh, uh, violet plot is a, uh, a temperature controlled crystal oscillator. In fact, it's the same one that was used in the uh, uh, Hermes board, uh, the prior uh, HPSDR system the Tapper designed. And the green plot is an inexpensive oven oscillator. Uh, this is a, an isotemp that you can buy uh, surplus on eBay for anywhere from 10 to $30. And what you can see is that with the temperature controlled crystal oscillator, its stability is never as good as the oven oscillator. But the point where the GPS gets better is at a shorter time interval. At about uh, 15 seconds, uh, the GPS is starting to get better than the uh, performance of the temperature controlled oscillator. Whereas with the oven oscillator, the performance is much better and you have to go all the way out to about uh, 800 seconds before the performance crosses. And the, the magic of the GPS DO is to find the uh, time constant for the control loop that takes advantage uh, to give you the best of the crystal and then transition to the best of the uh, GPS over longer time. And that's the, the whole goal of the design. So this is the Mark I uh, clock module. And I'm not going to go through the details except to point out that it's awfully complicated. And there's a, a big FPGA in the middle. And FPGAs mean that you have to do programming. So uh, this uh, version uh, was a uh, traditional uh, GPS DO design uh, with a few tweaks, but, uh, but works pretty much the way I described before of comparing pulse per second signals and uh, matching phase. Uh, that was what we were working on a year ago. But uh, along with uh, that project, uh, thanks to some generous support from Nathaniel and the NSF, I was able to do a very detailed uh, performance comparison of a whole bunch of uh, U-Blocks GPS modules. And what we learned from that was that, first of all, the latest GPS modules, and particularly the dual frequency ones, uh, have incredibly low jitter. Uh, the the uh, ZF9T module has four nanoseconds of peak to peak jitter. So uh, that's, uh, I'm sorry, four nanoseconds plus or minus of so peak jitter. Um, and uh, uh, that's uh, much better than the older uh, GPS modules. Also, we learned that uh, these modules can output not just a pulse per second, but you can actually program them to go up to 10 megahertz or beyond. And surprisingly, if you do that, uh, the Allen deviation at 10 megahertz is actually better than it is at pulse per second. Uh, the phase noise, which is important for radio applications, is off. But the, uh, but the actual frequency stability is very good. And then along with that, uh, we discovered that uh, in the telecom industry, there's a uh, category of chips called jitter attenuators that are designed for cleaning up clocks that are distributed across multiple boards. And basically, uh, it's a uh, phase lock loop that's driven by a uh, low noise oscillator uh, for short term stability and is phase locked to the external clock signal that's coming in. And uh, it actually implements just about all the stuff that you need for a GPS disciplined oscillator. Um, it, it cleans up the phase noise of the dirty output and uh, it gives us the a PLL with a bandwidth down to about 10 seconds or so. Uh, so uh, it basically provides all the capability we need in the uh, uh, a GPS DO design, no programming involved. Uh, it's a, a one time configuration exercise. And uh, the chip that we're using, the, the Silicon Labs 5345, has 10 frequency outputs available. Um, I think, Scotty, six of them are completely independent frequency. The others have to be, uh, uh, can be independent, but they have to be within certain maps based on the other frequencies that are chosen. So uh, we have the ability to get multiple outputs at anywhere from 100 kilohertz to 1,000 megahertz uh, plus. So it's just an extremely useful signal source. Uh, 
Um, the design, as Scotty already mentioned, uh, that we want to use is the, the GPS module that provides uh, a 10 megahertz output and as well as pulse per second. And the footprints that are going on the board will support uh, the dual frequency ZF9T, which is the gold version. It has two time pulse outputs, so it can give us both the 10 megahertz to drive the, the synthesizer and the pulse per second that we need. Um, the next uh, silver model is the Neo M8 uh, receiver, also from U blocks. It's kind of the prior generation uh, of the ZF9T, and it also has two outputs and will perform not quite as well, but uh, a reasonable performance. And then at very low cost, for about $20 for the module, uh, the uh, U-Blocks uh, Neo M9N receiver is available. Uh, the problem with that is it only has a single time pulse output. So if we use that unit and program its output to uh, 10 megahertz to drive the synthesizer, we do not have pulse per second available. And since PPS is an important part of the science requirements uh, for the Tangerine SDR, uh, we may not make the unit available with that module, but for a very low cost system, uh, we could, uh, could use that if uh, we desired to. So uh, the Mark II of the clock modules mentioned, it's using the 10 megahertz or thereabouts. We may tune that frequency to get best noise performance. It goes into the 5345, which acts like a, a GPS DO. And uh, the output then is going to be locked to uh, uh, that input signal. But it also has a temperature controlled crystal oscillator uh, if running at 48 megahertz that provides the short term stability and the low phase noise. Again, we have 10 uh, frequency outputs, so it can give us everything that the tangerine uh, requires, plus other uses. This is the block diagram, and you might notice that it's a whole lot simpler than the one that I showed you for the Mark I. It's basically the GPS module uh, providing a 10 megahertz signal to the 5345 chip, uh, plus uh, the second output from the GPS of pulse per second goes to the connector, as well as just the data stream from the GPS. This plot does, chart does not show the TCXO, but uh, there's a 48 megahertz TCXO that's uh, connected to the 5345. And uh, that will be built onto the board, uh, but we'll have an external connector available. So for higher performance than the TCXO we're, we're supplying, uh, a user could provide their own uh, better quality 48 megahertz reference uh, to improve the short term performance and possibly the uh, phase noise. Uh, this is the performance uh, from the three uh, GPSs um, outputting at 10 megahertz. And again, this is Allen deviation. Uh, note that this one starts at 0 0.1 seconds on the left. But we can see uh, that the M9N is the most inexpensive unit. Uh, is also the poorer quality. Uh, it uh, has one point uh, at around one second where it's about the same as the second unit, but then it gets worse and never uh, matches. The violet line is the um, bronze, uh, or sorry, the silver grade Neo M9T, which you can see is significantly better still. But the uh, the 10 megahertz from the ZF9T, the green line, uh, is incredibly good. So at uh, 0 0.1 second, uh, it's two parts in 10 to the minus 10th, or two, uh, two billionths, or I'm sorry, two tenths of a part per billion. And at one second, uh, it's uh, about 8 and 10 to the uh, minus 11, uh, 11th. Uh, so the 10 megahertz output from the GPS by itself meets our stability requirement. We wouldn't really need the synthesizer uh, to use this except for two things. One is that the phase noise of this output is not sufficient to use for a radio application. We need to clean it up. And uh, the second is every now and then the GPS will lose lock and you need some kind of a holdover so the frequency stays relatively uh, stable during momentary uh, losses. And the uh, TCXO and the synthesizer provides that. Uh, so uh, we, are, we are using the 5345 for a couple of very good reasons, but the raw performance of the F9T receiver is just sort of amazing. Uh, this is the output of uh, the evaluation boards for the uh, jitter attenuator chips. 
Uh, and there are two different boards being tested here, two different chips. Um, and two different oscillator modules. Uh, the blue and the green are a board uh, that has um, a uh, crystal oscillator. Uh, blue, blue and the green are from uh, the, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I have to, it's hard for me to, to read this. The blue, blue and the green are from the uh, TCXO, I'm sorry, from the XO, they're the worst performance. Uh, signal. Uh, the uh, violet and the red are from the TCXO and uh, provide, a, as you can see, much better uh, performance um, by themselves. So this is, this is just the quality of the short-term oscillator. Uh, it'll get worse over long term, but uh, uh, you can see that, again, we're, we're down at about 1 in 10 to the 10th uh, at one second, which is uh, in excess of our design goal for stability. So there are some trade-offs in this design. Uh, it's much simpler. There's no FPGA program required. Uh, the lower overall cost of the system makes it uh, less painful to use a better quality GPS module. So there's a, a trade-off there. And we get this incredible frequency agility of being able to provide anything from 100 kilohertz to over a gigahertz. Uh, the cons are that the 48 megahertz frequency that, that the chip requires limits the oscillator choices. We can find a lot more 10 megahertz oscillators than we can 48. Um, the loop bandwidth of the chip is fine for the performance that we're talking about, but it's not a narrow enough or a long enough time constant to get the benefit of using a, a much higher quality oscillator. Two so minutes. This will never be, I'm sorry? Two minutes. Good, thank you. This will never be a, a lab quality, uh, but it will be absolutely uh, fine for a ham shack or any kind of moderate use. And the holdover is more complica complicated. Um, and rather than go into that, uh, which is covered on some following slides, I'll stop now so that we have time for a, a question or two. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Gareth, are there any questions? Yeah, we have uh, one from the chat uh, from John John Farmer. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, the question is, is the PLL in the 5345 a true continuous control PLL, such as an older PD and oscillator analog frequency control, or is it the digital PLL used in ham rigs with limited resolution, limited by counter resolution? It is a digital PSL. Um although it's a much more sophisticated one than, than the typical. I think, John, you may be talking about the, uh, like the 5328 chips and some other inexpensive uh, uh, chips that uh, uh, have been available for some time. And they do have somewhat limited frequency resolution. Uh, this uh, unit can be programmed uh, in um, uh, one hertz increments or better. And again, remember, we're not using this as a tunable VFO. This is providing a reference frequency that will be divided uh, in the uh, DSP of the radio itself. So we don't need uh, to be able to tune it, but we can set the frequency to, to a uh, better than one hertz. And the, the resolution is extremely high because the digital phase lock loop is running up at the several gigahertz range. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, dividers, uh, can be used to get down to a, a very accurate frequency uh, uh, that, uh, again, there, there might be a microhertz offset, but it will be a very small one. And it will be constant because, uh, again, we're using this at, at one frequency. We're not tuning it as a VFO. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. I think okay. that's all the time we have for questions uh, now, but you can put your questions into the chat 